the issues I come down to or the issue I came down to before I received Christ was the question of evil. There's also the dichotomy of predetermination and free will, which are mutually exclusive but coexist in the scripture. Those questions are the ones that when you really finally get down to an issue that is a real decision point for people who are serious and who are good-hearted and who are truly open-minded, predetermination, free will, and, um, and, then, and, and the problem of evil. You know, either God is not all good or he's not all powerful or there wouldn't be evil. So those are some issues that if you can address those, that'd be good. Okay. I'm gonna, this is sort of the, the passage that I like to begin the, this kind of discussion with. Because they are, they are separable items, <clears throat> but they are, of course, related, this whole you know, sovereignty, free will, and then the, the evil issue. This is the story of David at Kyla. Okay, let's just read through the story because I think you're, something's going to jump out at you here. So David learns in the first verse, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Kyla and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, Should I go and attack the Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go, kick their butts and save Kyla. But David's men said to him, Behold, we're afraid of you. How much more if we go to Kyla against the armies of the Philistines? And so he inquires of the Lord again. God says, Didn't you hear me? Arise, go down to Kyla, for I will give the Philistines in your hands. So he does. And at the end here, David saves the inhabitants of this city. So he's in this city, and we read this. When Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to Kyla, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. That's preparatory to what we're going to see in a moment, that little detail. It was told Saul that David had come to Kyla. Of course, Saul is chasing David all over the place, trying to kill him. We all know the story of David and Saul. And so Saul hears this, and he's like, this is sweet. <clears throat> Saul says, God has given him into my hands, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. That was dumb, David. So Saul gets it in his head. I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to surround the city, and there is no way out. So Saul summons the people to ward, go down to Kyla to besiege, lay siege to it. David and his men. David finds out Saul was plotting against him, and he said to Abiathar, hey, bring the ephod here. I got a question for God. Then David said, oh, Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come up to Kyla to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Kyla surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? So he asked two questions. Is Saul going to come down here? And when he gets here, are the people I just saved going to turn me over? Because they, you know, they don't want their city attacked and laid siege to. Are they, are they going to give me up? <clears throat> and the Lord said, he will come down. In verse 12, then David said, will the men of Kyla surrender me? He repeats it. Surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul. You only answered one question. I still need the answer to the second one. And the Lord said, yep. You betcha, they're going to surrender you. So what does David do? Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and got out of Dodge. They leave. Do you see the point? God foreknows two things in this passage that never happen. Foreknowledge does not necessitate predestination. And this is not the only passage like that. So, on the one hand, the fact that God foreknows, I mean, think about the old, you know, I don't know, what Heidelberg Catechism, whatever it is. But the thing that theologians love to say when they talk about omniscience, God knows all things real and possible. Have you ever really thought about that statement? Well, if, if God knows the possible, but the possible, by definition, isn't stuff that happens, it's just possible, then how can foreknowledge 
necessitate predestination. Because if God knows it, doesn't it have to happen? No. Okay, I'm not, I'm not giving you anything different than that little ditty that you always hear in theology class. It undermines the idea of foreknowledge necessitating predestination, but it seems like people just don't realize it. There is predestination. So the things that don't happen are not predestinated. What about the things that do happen? Again, my view, if you've read you know, my, my myth draft here, my view is that the things that do happen, God could have predestinated them, but he doesn't have to. The fact that he knows something will happen does not necessitate predestination either because foreknowledge of an event, whether it happens or not, does not necessitate predestination. The fact of foreknowing does not require something happening. So if God foreknows an event that will happen, we have to be consistent and say, well, that doesn't necessitate that was predestinated either, although it could be because there's very clear scriptural language that God does predestinate certain events. God is very free. I'm not going to tell him he can't do this. I like to say I try not to put the words God and can't into too many sentences. God can do that if he wants to. God can knock Saul off his horse and say, you, come over here. I got a job for you to do. Just shut up. Go to, <laughs> go to Damascus. You're going to meet this guy. I mean, he can do all that. Hey, there is predestination language. And so what you have, here's we're back to general revelation. You have a situation where the things that happen in life may or may not be predestinated by God. Now, I am not an open theist, okay, because open theists like to sort of deny, they, have, they like to deny foreknowledge or redefine it. Okay, I don't see any, any reason for doing that. And they don't like predestination really in any sense, and I think that goes too far too. I have friends who are open theists and, you know, we have these discussions and they're good discussions. But I'm just, I don't think that that's coherent, that I have to go one way or the other. I'm just going to let the content be what it is. Uh, evil. God created humankind to be his imagers. And we can talk about the image of God. The image of God is not a thing put into you. It's not the ability to pray. It's not the ability to speak. It's not intellect. It's not a spiritual inclination. It's no quality. And I know that that's very traditional to say that. But, you know, <laughs> sometimes I need to be careful what I, what I say. I, I have, I've, gone into, I've gone to places and said something like, you know, if you believe the image of God is something put into you, then you might as well just be pro-choice, pro-abortion, at least until brain development. Because all those things require a brain. The little single cell thing that's conceived in a woman that we would call a person that is a human being doesn't have any of these capabilities. Well, they're there potentially, Mike. That's what they're going to be. Great, now we have life that's potentially sacred. Ooh, that's comforting. Again, why are you pro-life from the point of fertilization? If you're defining the image of God that way, you have no argument. You've got no argument at all, other than you just don't like the thought of abortion. The image of God is actually a status. You know, again, if you've read my stuff, I argue for the you know, point of Hebrew grammar here, the bet essentia, the bet of predication, Bet Salem should be translated not in our image, but as our image. Prepositions mean things. In English, the word in, believe it or not, is variable. If I say, put the dishes in the sink, what am I denoting? Location, putting them someplace. That's what in means there. If I say, I broke the vase in pieces, I'm talking about result. Okay? If I say I wrote the letter in pencil, I'm talking about instrumentality. 
If I say, I work in medicine, what do I mean? It means I work as a doctor, a PA, a surgeon, a physician, whatever. In other words, it's about function and capacity. It's about role. That's what we have in Genesis. God creates humankind as his image. Think of it as a verb. We image God. We represent God. We are him as though he were here in the flesh. Christ, of course, this is why he's called the express image. He's like the ultimate imager in every way. We are being conformed to his image. What does that mean? Well, we know what it means. It means we're being made like him. We're, we're made a progressively better representation of him. Again, all these ideas, you know, work, work together. So if that's true, <clears throat> we have, as our theology classes tell us, we, have, we share attributes with God. If we represent God, then we need communicable attributes, don't we? We need to be able to do things. We are reflections of God. One of those attributes is free will. God is a perfectly free being. He is exhaustively free. We are not. We have that attribute just like we have other attributes of God incrementally in you know, small doses. But if we lacked freedom, we would no longer be like God, would we? Freedom is indispensable to imaging. If you don't have human freedom, you are not the divine imager. It is an essential quality to being like God. That means that when, and since we aren't God, when we are tempted, we will fall. We will act selfishly. We will do horrible things. We don't do horrible things. I mean, yesterday we talk, I talked about, you know, this whole God and evil thing. I don't believe that God predestinates evil. Evil happens. There's no necessary link between foreknowledge and predestination. God knows it's going to happen. He doesn't mean he causes it. I also don't think he needs it for his plan to work out. The reason that there's evil in the world is because God decided to make humans who shared his abilities and capacities. And we, because we lack those abilities, we lack his holiness, we lack his character in the full capacity, we will do evil. We will use a God-given thing for self-interest and harm of others. You say, well, can't God just step in there and stop that? Do you realize what, what God would have to do to stop evil? He would have to eliminate humanity. Evil is a consequence of God's good decision. And I think a decision we, we all enjoy to, to have us exist. Now, God knows that since we are not him, he knows what's going to happen. He doesn't predestinate the fall, and he ain't surprised by it. But he deemed it preferable. He enjoyed the idea of creating humanity, knowing the risk to us. There is no risk to God but knowing what, what, pardon the pun, what the fallout would be, that the potential for rebellion was there. And so we should not blame God for evil. We should blame people for evil. And we should recognize that the reason evil is part of our world is because we are not God. If we were God, we would get the utopia that we so desperately desire. If we were God, then we would have the place that we really want to live in. So rather than turning it on its head like the Gnostics do and making God the cause of evil, again, they're operating on certain presuppositions. You know, what they want to shoot at are the traditional views of God and evil. That's where they find their strength. Because... They want you to feel like 
I have to admit that God's just an evil person or capricious or something. God is someone who wanted you to have life and wanted you to have a good life. And you ruined it. Or, again, the history of humanity ruins it. But he didn't just obliterate you or Adam and Eve or you know, how, any of the biblical stories. He doesn't do that. God is a fan of redemption. God likes that idea just as much as he liked the first one. So I don't think God needs evil at all. It's not an indispensable cog you know, or plan in the way he wants things to work out. I just have to have all this horrible stuff to make it work. No, he doesn't. But he's left with the decision, I'm either going to redeem humanity or kill them all. And he makes the first choice. 